Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963 thank you all so much for your prayers and support god bless when young people are told by their leaders that work is a scam and that stealing things from other people is a human right how do you think your economy is going to look in 10 years how about your civilization the answer depends in part on just how much idleness and theft you put up with any society that cannot declare unequivocally and with confidence that stealing is wrong has no future. When you let the mob loot, you are doomed. This is why we used to shoot looters, not because we hated them, it wasn't personal, but in order to defend the foundation of all that we have, which is private property secured by the law. Without that, we would be living in savagery and chaos. In Chicago, they already are. This is what America's second largest city looked like this weekend. There's no point to that. Nobody's benefiting. What you're seeing instead is civilization unraveling, unrestrained violence and destruction effectively unchallenged by government authorities, the mindless breaking of things, the rage of stupid children. If you let that continue, there will be nothing left standing. Most people don't need to be told that. It's so obvious, it's intuitive. Would you let your kids set fire to the living room? Probably not. But the new mayor of Chicago, who is an ideologue and a racist, understands that these stupid children are his militia. When they destroy what others built, he becomes more powerful. Their destruction has a political use, and so he refuses to criticize them. They're stealing because they're hungry, he told us. Is that the answer? To loot because it's a form of reparations? To loot because they, that's how they can eat? The real answer is, how do we make sure, the question is, how do we make sure that people can eat? Look, no one is gonna condone, um, you know, behavior that, that quite frankly speaks to a level of desperation. So you're not, people you're not condoning out, looting? I, I'm saying that people are acting out of desperation. We don't want a society that is acting out of desperation, but you have to pay attention to the cries that people have. So By you're, you're not that, condoning looting? There's no way to, to, to embrace that. What I'm saying is you can't condone the looting that corporations continue to do every single day when they take tax dollars from black, brown, white folks all over the city of Chicago so that they can turn a profit. They're trying to eat because <laughs> starvation is a pressing problem in Chicago, but it's not. Obesity is a pressing problem in Chicago. About a quarter of Chicago high school students are overweight. They join the overwhelming majority of their parents. Obesity is the problem. The shortage isn't of food. And as if to prove the point, the same mob the mayor just defended reportedly tried to break into the Art Institute of Chicago. There was no bread in that museum, only Chagall's and de Kooning's. So these are not people who are trying to feed themselves. These are people who are trying to destroy civilization, destroy a museum a symbol of our evolution. We shouldn't lie about this. It's very obvious. And if you let it continue, you're done. But Chicago's leaders are lying about it for political reasons. This makes them more powerful. Destroying things that other people built that previous generations created makes this new generation of vandals who add nothing more powerful. That's the whole point. A state senator from Illinois called Robert Peters called the riots, quote, a mass protest against poverty and segregation. Right. 
Chicago's outgoing mayor, the destroyer Lori Lightfoot, agreed. The vast majority of the young people came downtown, came downtown because it was a great um, weather and an opportunity to enjoy the city. That's absolutely entirely appropriate. Um, there are a few that came with different intentions, and they have, they have and they will be dealt with. Um, but I'm not going to uh, use your language, which I think is um, wrong, uh, to say there's main. Right. So you can bet that none of these destroyers will be hunted down like animals like the protesters on January 6th have been for over three years. Their lives won't be destroyed. Their families won't be hounded. They won't be banned from Airbnb. And yet, of course, what they did is far more destructive to our society than anything you saw in Washington in January of 2021. Their behavior is encouraged. So what happens if we, you encourage this kind of behavior, if you cheer the mob rather than restraining the mob? Well, ugly and totally inevitable things will happen. Productive people will flee, innocents will die, and ultimately you will get from this mob racial attacks. All of that is happening in Chicago right now, all of it. Watch this woman surrounded and beaten this weekend because of her skin color. So that footage was shared widely on social media. We didn't have to hunt it down. It came with the caption, you may have seen it, yay, we get active. So this was racist mob violence. And we should not be surprised by that. This is what mobs do. The hive mind takes over, the lowest instincts take over, and people who are different get hurt, often killed. This is widely known and has been for a long time. Just last year, in fact, Joe Biden signed the Emmett Till Anti-Lynching Act that made what you just saw specifically a felony. And he signed that to much fanfare. And yet, and this is the key, no one at his Department of Justice is investigating that video or anything that happened in Chicago over the weekend because they support it. Democrats approve of racial violence. They are stoking it everywhere. No, it's not your imagination. They want race, hate, and violence. The first thing we need to understand is that there is only one race the human race, Caucasians, Africans, Asians, Indians, Arabs, and Jews are not different races. We are different ethnicities of the human race. All human beings have the same physical characteristics with minor variations. All human beings are equally created in the image and likeness of God, as we read in Genesis 1, and 27. Then God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God loved the world so much that he sent Jesus to lay down his life for us, as we read in John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The world obviously includes all ethnic groups. Jesus commands us to love one another as he loves us. John 13, 34, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Jesus declares this in Matthew 25, 40. Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. If we treat a person with contempt, we are mistreating a person created in God's image. We are hurting somebody whom God loves and for whom Jesus died. Brothers and sisters, racism has been a plague on humanity for thousands of years, and this should not be. When Jesus returns, Galatians 3.28 will be completely realized. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. Joe Biden released a statement about a young man called Ralph Yarl, a teenager, a black teenager who was shot after showing up to an elderly man's house in Kansas City. We don't know the details of this. There's much we don't know. And of course, we feel for anyone who was shot, including this teenager. But the White House didn't pause for a moment 
before drawing conclusions from this sad encounter and using those conclusions to further divide the country on the basis of race. The president said, and we're quoting, no parents should have to worry that their kid will be shot after ringing the wrong doorbell. Well, that's demonstrably true. But of course, the president is saying this in order to further divide the country along racial lines and to tell a story that is, in fact, not supported by the facts, which is that black teenagers are murdered by elderly white people just for showing up on their doorsteps. Ralph Yarrell, thank heaven, did not die from his injuries. He was just released from the hospital. But these kinds of mistakes do happen, and they're always sad, assuming this was a mistake. Again, we don't know all the details. This same weekend, a 20-year-old woman called Caitlin Gillis was shot and killed after her friend turned into the wrong driveway in upstate New York. A man shot her dead in the passenger seat. But there was no statement from Joe Biden and Kamala Harris about this, of course, because Caitlin Gillis was white, and therefore her death could not be used to further incite racial conflict that benefits the Democratic Party. Now, if you think that we're not giving our leaders enough credit, if you're wondering, could they really be that cynical and destructive? Unfortunately, they not only could be, but they are. And the effects, of course, are destructive, always and everywhere. Over the weekend in Compton, California, needless to say, a Democratic Party stronghold, it's not hard to imagine a future in which there are no more gas stations. Because in California, mobs apparently can just walk into a store, including a gas station, and destroy the place, smash the windows, and take what they want. We know that because it happened on Sunday in Compton. Now, this mob was not starving. No, they didn't steal food. They stole beer, condoms, and cigarettes. <laughs> Oh, it looks third world, you hear people say. But that's not accurate. Very few third world countries would put up with that for a minute. El Salvador is far safer than Los Angeles. In Los Angeles, criminals control the stores and the streets because there aren't enough police to respond. And of course, they know that perfectly well. And that's why the people who looted that store then did burnouts in the street while the store was being looted. Watch this. That's a public street. That's not a parking lot in a rural area. That's Los Angeles. You can't live in a country like that. No normal person can live in a chaotic, dangerous country like that. And so the normal productive people will leave. They absolutely will leave. And not just Los Angeles, not just Chicago, all over the country in the cities controlled by the Democratic Party. In New York, a man with 11 prior arrests just bludgeoned a female police officer with a bottle in the middle of the day. You're seeing the attack on your screen right now. And the sad news is a lot of these attacks, and you see them online if you pay attention, are racial. And that's the last thing you want. You definitely don't want people hurting each other because they're of different races, not in a country like this, not in any country, but especially not here. This is not what we were promised, and yet it's what we're getting. As if to underscore that point, the riding this weekend in Chicago began in a place called Millennium Park. If that sounds familiar and you're not from the city, that's because Millennium Park, Grant Park is part of it, is the same place where Barack Obama gave his famous 2008 victory speech in which he promised a better future. Listen. It's been a long time coming, but tonight, because of what we did on this day, in this election, at this defining moment, change has come to America. Change has come to America. Barack Obama was more prophetic than we knew. That was just 15 years ago. But today we're seeing the change that Barack Obama brought to America. This is what it looks like. Spiritual warfare is off the charts. Battle lines are being drawn and people are choosing sides. The United States is divided on just about every issue. Race, homosexuality, transgenderism, abortion, climate change, gun rights, and the list goes on. Jesus said that a kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, as we read in Matthew 12, 25. But Jesus knew their thoughts, 
and said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself will not stand. Jesus tells us he is the reason behind the division we are seeing today as we read in Luke 12, 51-53. Do you suppose that I came to give peace on earth? I tell you, not at all, but rather division. For from now on, five in one house will be divided, three against two, and two against three. Father will be divided against son, and son against father, mother against daughter, and daughter against mother, mother mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Jesus then goes on to rebuke the multitudes for not knowing the time they were living in, as we read in Luke 12, 54 through 56. Then he also said to the multitudes, Whenever you see a cloud rising out of the west, immediately you say, A shower is coming, and so it is. And when you see the south wind blow, you say, There will be hot weather, and there is. Hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky and of the earth, but how is it you do not discern this time? Jesus was rebuking the multitudes for not recognizing the times they were living in. Jesus, the promised Messiah, was standing right there before them, and they didn't even know it. If the multitudes of Jesus' day missed Jesus' first coming, how much more important is it for us today to discern the times we live in and make sure we don't miss the signs of his second coming? Jesus now goes on to tell a parable about his true followers and those who are not, as we read in Matthew 13, 24 through 30. Another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? He said to them, An enemy has done this. The servants said to him, Do you want us to then go and gather them up? But he said, No, lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, First, gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Jesus went on to explain the parable of the wheat and tares, as we read in Matthew 13, 36 through 43. Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house. And his disciples came to him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. He answered and said to them, He who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of this age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and those who practice lawlessness, and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth, Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their Father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Those who genuinely follow Jesus are the wheat, and those who don't are the tares. I believe we are witnessing the wheat being separated from the tares. Are you a wheat or a tear? Jesus said, as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, there would be an increase in deception, false Christ who will deceive many, Wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, Christian persecution, apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. Now to the deadly crisis in Sudan calls for a 24-hour ceasefire shattered tonight. Families trapped in their homes with the death toll rising, including those three workers from the World Food Program. ABC's Marcus Moore on the new fighting despite these efforts for a ceasefire. 
tonight, hope for a 24-hour ceasefire in Sudan shattered within minutes by explosions and gunfire in the capital of Khartoum. Both sides accusing the other of breaking the truce. Forces loyal to rival generals are locked in a vicious struggle for control of the country. At least 270 people, many civilians, have been killed and more than 2,600 others wounded in the past four days. Three members of the UN's World Food Program have also been killed. Even a U.S. diplomatic convoy came under direct attack yesterday, gunmen reportedly firing 100 rounds at the armored vehicles. U.S. officials say no embassy employees were hurt. This action was reckless. It was irresponsible. The U.N. reports about a dozen hospitals in the capital area have shut down completely because of shelling. International aid groups also sounding the alarm over the worsening humanitarian crisis in Sudan, where one in three people suffer from acute food insecurity. David, in some parts of Sudan, aid organizations say their offices and facilities have been looted, including a warehouse where food and humanitarian aid was taken. There is also growing concern in some western states after a season of record snow. Nearly 900 inches fell in Utah's Cottonwood Canyon outside Salt Lake City. That's roughly the height of a six-story building. Mammoth, California, got nearly as much. CBS's Elise Preston joins us now with more on the threat ahead. Here in L.A. and other parts of the West, temperatures are in the low 70s. That's warm enough to melt the snowpack, but the ground can't absorb it all. Communities are going from freezing to flooding. Look at that. Five inches of snow. Snow is falling near Colorado Springs today, even as the mercury rises this spring. The big melt is now threatening several western states with severe flooding after a season of record snow. There's just too much snow melt to be accommodated in our, our rivers and channels. In Arizona, the intense water flow washed out roads and forced rescues. In Utah, which saw historic snow levels, residents are bracing for more flooding after a series of avalanches, mudslides, and sinkholes. Just this amount of water flow that we're seeing right here is strong enough to knock you off your feet. Masia Sumbani is working her way through dead crops after Cyclone Freddy devastated this farm in Moamba in southern Mozambique. Heavy flooding after the cyclone destroyed much of the maize, tomatoes, and cucumbers grown here. Now she has to start from scratch. Farming is what I do for a living. We also have to hire people to work the land. When flooding happens, we lose our crops. We still have to pay the workers and also treat the land. So it's loss after loss. Experts are worried about the worsening effects of climate change and what it means for food production in a country where two thirds of the population relies on agriculture and fishing. This is the coastal city of Beira four years ago after Cyclone Idai hit. It was one of the worst tropical cyclones in the southern hemisphere. It affected millions of people across Mozambique, Malawi and Zimbabwe. Experts say this region of the Indian Ocean has the highest average increase in surface temperature of all tropical oceans. Higher temperatures mean more energy to supercharge weather systems, which they say are increasingly developing into cyclones. Most recently, Cyclone Freddy was the longest surviving tropical storm in recorded history, regaining strength six times over. Many floodplains and low coastal areas make Mozambique vulnerable to flooding. It's been concerning for two things. First, they have had, they've been bigger and more frequent. And that's concerning because um, we're going to, and it's not just, the, a lot of times we focus on the cyclones um, because they are very, and the flooding, it's very dramatic. It is um, very um, visually shocking. But we have other impacts like droughts. The droughts during the 80s and 90s killed over 100,000 people, but it was every month people dying over a long period of time. It doesn't catch the media attention. So the climate is, is scary in not only in all aspects, in the floods, the droughts, the, um, it is, it's really, and if we're really struggling with what's now, and this is the beginning, it's gonna get worse. In the last decade, Mozambique's been hit by several high-intensity tropical cyclones, killing many, destroying buildings, and costing the economy billions of dollars. And experts say it should prepare for more. There are two key prophecies concerning Jesus' signs of his coming and the end of the age that are crucial to discerning that we are living in the last days. The first prophecy is found in Matthew 24, 8. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. 
As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. This is how end time signs such as wars, famines, pestilences, and earthquakes will occur. They will become more frequent and more intense as we get closer to Jesus' return. The second prophecy is in Luke 21, 28. Now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads, because your redemption draws near. Notice Jesus said when these things begin to happen. Jesus was saying that when you see a convergence of Bible prophecy, look up and lift up your heads, because your redemption draws near. We are witnessing not only the convergence of Bible prophecy around the world, we are experiencing the frequency and intensity of these prophetic events as well. To the deadly violence in Sudan and its ripple effect in the region, affecting critical aid that is meant for millions facing hunger. World News Tonight anchor David Muir was in South Sudan when the deadly violence broke out in the north, and he's here now with a first look at his report. And I can only imagine what you witnessed firsthand, David. It's incredibly dire. Robin, George, Eva, great to be with you here this morning. As you all know, this is a region that knows war, but we were on the ground to report on a very different battle. They're now in a real fight there against climate change. We were in South Sudan, and you're about to see what we witnessed. More than a million people, families and children, in dire need right now. This morning here, our first look. We land in South Sudan, where we are told there is an urgent effort to get to more than a million people in desperate need because of climate. The UN trucks waiting. We head out to the World Food Program, traveling down the only road in, carrying aid from Sudan. Mud walls holding the water back. And then the only way to get to so many of the families here is by boat. Climate change making the extremes here only more extreme. Four years in a row now of historic floods, with waters unable to recede. This is a very common sight here after four years of relentless rains. This is a tiny piece of land completely surrounded uh, by the waters here, an island in and of itself. And these are the families that have stayed behind to continue to raise their children here. And what do they feed the children here? With no land to farm anymore we are told the water lilies, a mother in the distance. The haunting sound, the coughing, the determined work in stagnant, dangerous flood water. Reaching down to pull out the water lilies and their bulbs. It is what they do for their children. Mothers are feeding their children water lilies. Unfortunately, they are. It is a coping mechanism because they do not have enough food. How do they get any food when they're completely surrounded by water? Uh, that is a biggest challenge that uh, they are facing here, the availability of food. Before they had land where they could cultivate food, but now they are completely cut off. Families cut off with no livestock. This used to be farmland before the floods. The livestock, uh, it's impossible to know just how much has been lost. You can see they're nothing but skin and bones, these cows here. And when there is no food, there is sickness. We learn of the children on the edge of starvation. The hospital in Bentu. The children here who need help, and the young mother, her baby just 40 days old, weighing less than four pounds. You must be relieved that your baby is doing much better. She's saying yes. Yes, she says, her newborn son and his tiny grip, a sign of hope. This morning, that deadly fighting uh, in Sudan to the north that broke out while we were there in the region, showing no signs of stopping. The World Food Program telling us overnight that that critical route from Sudan remains halted. Uh, we witnessed the last convoy to arrive, 7,000 tons of aid stuck in a war zone. This is really critical. The world is baffled at the events taking place in the weather, and yet it was foretold 2,000 years ago in Bible prophecy that this would happen. I can provide a biblical perspective that climate change is real and Bible prophecy supports it. Although Jesus does not call it climate change, he calls it the signs of his coming and the end of the age, as we read in Matthew 24, 3-8. Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars? See that you are not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Pestilence is the Greek word loimus, which means a plague. Definition of a plague is any large-scale calamity, especially when thought to be sent by God. 
We are currently living in a time Jesus refers to as the birth pains. The term birth pains is an illustration based on how a woman goes through labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and in intensity until the baby finally comes. So we can expect pestilence in the form of weather to continue to be more frequent and more intense right up to the time of Jesus' second coming. Should we be concerned about so-called climate change? No. These things are prophesied and must take place. Christians can take comfort because these signs are telling us that the time of the Lord's return is near. As these things get worse, and they will, we know that the Lord's return is not far away. Climate change is simply Satan's counter to Jesus' signs of his return and the end of the age. Given in Matthew 24, Luke 21, and Mark 13, the Apostle Paul says this in 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4, But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. Things will continue to get worse, and what we are seeing is just the beginning. But take heart. Jesus said this in Luke 21, 36. Watch, therefore, and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Another wildfire in New Jersey today. The River Road wildfire started this afternoon in Burlington County. Three major fires erupted across the state last week, and the danger is not over yet. No snow, warmer temperatures, combined with an invasive beetle, have made forests across New Jersey tinderboxes this year. So far, 517 wildfires have erupted, burning more than 7,000 acres, compared to 327 fires burning more than 400 acres the same period last year. Revelers in Bangkok celebrate the Thai New Year with water fights, a tradition that marks the beginning of the rainy season. But this year it brought record temperatures, 45.4 degrees Celsius, a new high even for a country accustomed to hot weather. Outside the Grand Palace, a temporary respite from the heat for the birds and lots of umbrellas but not a drop of rain in sight. The heat waves being felt all across South and Southeast Asia. Bangladesh's capital Dhaka reached temperatures of 42 degrees Celsius, hotter than it's been in decades. Not so bad for those who can afford to retreat indoors into the air conditioning, but potentially life-threatening for those that can't. But while millions across the region are feeling the heat, there's little governments can do. In rural India, average temperatures are five degrees higher than usual for this time of year. Agricultural workers have little choice when it comes to working under the glare of the sun. And even if they can find somewhere to shelter, their land is baking. The temperatures have gone up considerably in recent years. Earlier, it would never go above 37 degrees Celsius. Now it goes up to 45 degrees. The heat is extremely harsh. My body is dehydrated, it needs water, and so do my crops. The heat is so bad that even if you irrigate them, they are still dry. With the mercury rising, everyone's watching the forecasts and hoping for rain. Summer may be coming to an end in the southernmost areas of Latin America, but the insect-borne diseases associated with hot weather are on the rise. The World Health Organization warns that mosquitoes of the Aedes genus, which transmit viral diseases such as dengue, chikungunya or Zika, are increasing in South America. Medical experts warn a perfect storm of conditions, rapid urbanization combined with heavy rains and heat waves could mean insect-borne diseases like dengue reach epidemic proportions this year. Northern Peru has struggled to cope with major flooding caused by Cyclone Yaku in March and the El Nino weather phenomenon this month. Earlier this week, Peruvian authorities sent a naval ship to the north, carrying 500 tonnes of aid for flood victims. Peru's meteorological service says the rains will continue. Health experts say the dengue epidemic that hit Latin America in 2019 and 2021 could return if urgent measures are not taken. Not only are we going to have, you know, more mosquitoes and more dengue just because it's hotter, but because everything is flooded, access to try to deal with the outbreaks is going to be much more difficult. So I think I think we need to brace ourselves for a very difficult year. As Paraguay experiences its worst ever chikungunya outbreak and dengue spreads further in the southern cone, it's clear that global warming is already impacting human health. Luke 21, 26 through 28. 
men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads, because your redemption draws near. The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive, in faith, the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in him, and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. Biblical repentance is changing your mind about Jesus Christ and turning to God in faith for salvation. Turning from sin is not the definition of repentance, but it is one of the results of genuine faith-based repentance towards the Lord Jesus Christ. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what? If his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning, my prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready! is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today.